Hello everyone, this is Defense Politics Asia and uh, this time around we have a panel you know, talking about a very very interesting topic which is actually the impact of de-dollarization. De de anyway, you know, uh, I will let coping things uh, to actually you know, kick off because this is actually organized by uh, the, the uh, these fellow speakers from the DPA Open Mic and they organize this entire thing. So I'm here just to be a participant and I think it will be very interesting to see, you know, how this discussion go. Coping. Cope, please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you much, Wyatt, for having this on. Um, so the topic of today is uh, de-dollarization and the effects uh, that might have. And uh, the purpose of this, so let me just uh, outline, I am so-called a sponsor. That is to say, I post the question, the initiative to kind of let's explore the topic of de-dollarization and the geopolitics of it. And from there on, I was fortunate to have uh, co-participants who are professionals. So I have uh, Aki as my co-questionnaire. Uh, and then we have uh, two professionals, that's Drew and Toby, who will be conveying an understanding to all of us. Uh, and so just to kind of make a quick disclaimer, I will be approaching this from the vantage point of a Norwegian for a couple of reasons. One, I am Norwegian. Two, uh, I'm from a country of those smaller economies where it may not seem so relevant, like we're talking about the US and Russia and China, right? But most of us watching this stream are probably gonna be from one of those smaller, less significant countries. And Norway is a good example because it is in the so-called global north. Yeah, there we go. So it's a no global north and it's relevant to the topic because it has a whole lot of overseas assets in USD. And then I will also try to juxtapose that with um, what is colloquially called the Global South, and that's a West African country of Ghana. Uh, the reason there is because I have friends there and vested interests, so bias. And the other thing is because I want more Ghanaians on. And more importantly, relevant to this uh, stream, uh, it will um, they have a different, it will be a cluster of ordinary countries who have a similar predicament, except that they have debt in USD or they have their own currency in debt, which is tied to the United States dollar otherwise. So there will be plenty of, uh, uh, I want to try to anchor it on those two vantage points. So the rest of you from other ordinary countries, be it from the global north or global south, will kind of get some concrete examples. After which, uh, Drew and Toby will be elaborating for us. Um, and I think that should do it for my introduction and disclaimer. Uh, I'll hand it over to my co-host, who I'm so fortunate to have here, so I'm not the only one asking questions. So uh, uh, yeah, okay, please uh, tell the audience some relevant information about yourself and if any preordained vantage point uh, you have uh, to um, disclaim. Sure, sure. So thank you, Coping Things and Wyatt for having me. Um, my vantage point would be from a Canadian's perspective. I'm from Canada and I study economics and business at University of Ottawa, so the capital. <laughs> and uh, my, my vantage point mostly would be how Canadians would be affected from de-dollarization because more, even more so than EU, Canada's economy is like this when it comes to USA and de-dollarization would affect us directly and so my vantage point would be that um another vantage point of mine would be a uh, perspective of indian because my parents are indian and um i have some assets that really make it relevant to me and uh that gives us two vantage points one from the western perspective and the other one eastern perspective so yeah and uh as a student i can tell you that uh the things that i'm taught especially the economics in the Western Hemisphere, um, they are they are very, very different from what we are taught in the Eastern the Eastern Hemisphere. So I would, de-dollarization de in terms of a Canadian would be very different from de-dollarization de in the Eastern Hemisphere because they won't as, won't be affected as much. So my, my job would be to simplifying most of the concept that we'll be discussing today into both these vantages vantage points <laughs> good stuff hey I, I forgot to add um because this is a little bit important when it comes to perspective as aki mentioned he's a economist student uh, he's not a professional yet and um, i am on the other hand completely uneducated i have no formal education or profession that gives me any relevant advantage to understanding the topics of economics or law and so forth which means basically I am just like you, I just happen to be curious. And so I will be asking the silly questions so you don't have to. Okay, uh, that being cleared out, I think we, um, 
who, uh, which one of you professionals want to start? Uh, give a little bit of a disclaimer of who you are and what kind of uh, qualifications you have, which uh, would make you, which, well, why are you here? <laughs> so we start with Drew. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I'm Drew. I'm from Singapore, just like White. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm a trained, uh, my undergraduate was in industrial and systems engineering, and I have a master's in uh, uh, business analytics. So basically, I'm a trained data scientist. Uh, I've worked in, uh, I've had a long and very weird career. I started up as an IT consultant, went into uh, uh, private equity, building a renewable energy power plants uh, in Asia. And after that, I went back uh, to, after I got my master's, then I went to work as an optimization consultant. So uh, it's kind of kind of odd career. And now I'm a derivatives trader. So I'm applying data science, uh, uh, basically, uh, techniques uh, to to derivatives trading. Uh, so my my interest uh, uh, really sparked off with if with uh, I, I've always had a general interest in geopolitics, but when, when Russia invaded, I was like, hey, something's really going on here. Uh, so I, I, I really uh, uh, and then I found why it's channel and I thought it was, uh, you know, one of the most neutral. Uh, it helps a Singaporean too, so I can understand his accent. I, I can you know, easily <laughs> understand what he's saying. And uh, yeah, so here I am. I, I'm just another regular guy. Some education, uh, had, had some some work experience, and uh, I have some ideas. Toby? Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my background is uh, I studied history at the Military Academy in Australia. So I have a love of history and uh, my understanding of finance and the whole dollar issue is basically a historical one. I'm not an economist. My uh, profession was law. Um, I'm now retired. I worked in Switzerland. Um, some of the work I did there was for large US multinationals. So I was a contract attorney. And so I drafted and negotiated a lot of contracts on behalf of US multinationals across Europe and South America and particularly Russia. Uh, so I have an understanding of how the world actually operates at that level. I'm skeptical of a lot of economic theory, but I'm also ignorant of it. So I, I can see a lot of economists like pulling their hair out at my poor use of terminology, but I do understand some of the history of uh, the dollar and financial movements and then reserve currencies. And I also have a reasonable grasp and some insight into what actually goes on in terms of uh, capital movements and investments in the world. Do I need to introduce myself, Sue? <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I think I mean, we all know who you are. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm a, I'm a Singaporean sitting in a bedroom, you know, making videos, putting on YouTube, and somehow you know, a lot of people watch me. I don't know. I, so that's true, though. Um, but this, uh, I don't have a background in economics as well. Actually, I, I don't really understand economics when I was young. And um, I am just have a very deep interest in geopolitics. And that's what I try to look at and watch. And uh, I hate politics. And then I started to look at politics. And I started to you know, understand politics. And that's how I you know, started DPA as well uh, a few years ago. And I started to write about geopolitics because, you know, I started to you know, make observations, start to understand things. And yet, a lot of things that we read you know, from the Western media, because Singapore is a pretty Western-influenced country, so we read mostly Western media. And it don't make sense. Too many things don't make sense. And then the news also don't make sense. And then I start to, I start to research more. And then I start to make observations and realize you know, a lot of the economic theories and a lot of those, what we thought that is normal, is not normal. Uh, like It doesn't actually work. A lot of things that they you know, all the economic theories or you no know, political theories, you no, know, nothing works. Uh, it's just theories that people teach in universities. So you no, know, that's why I started to observe more and start to come up with my own understanding of what is happening, and I start to corroborate you know, my theories versus what is actually happening, and uh, so I have my own weird insights about things. Yeah, and then somehow people want to listen to me, you know, so <laughs> so that works for me. Oh, coping. 
Well, I think that is a that is a very good introduction from all of you because uh, basically what we will have here is uh, coverage, generally speaking, of uh, power dynamics. Toby will be covering that well as well as Wyatt, I assume. Uh, all of us, of course, are want to be geopolitical analysts. We will be trying our best in one way or the other, but uh, we will get a lot of uh, technicalities and stuff like that cleared out, jargons and stuff like that. Uh, Drew is likely to be very helpful in that regard. Uh, I mean, his professions in, by himself are even topics by themselves in some regard. Like, what is a derivatives trader? My perception is that it is a stock trader, right? But, yeah, but more, I or less, yeah. more or less, right? More so, less. More or less. So, yeah. uh, so, well, the thing here is that we are going to be covering some inherently complicated and broad topics that are also interconnected to a whole lot of other complicated facets of geopolitics. And so I think we should just try to start off as easy as possible, simple as possible, and then try to get any relevant basics covered uh, as we go on. And so I will start with the first question and uh, followed by Aki with the second, and then we roll from there. So the first question is basically, what is the US dollar as a uh, foreign currency reserve? Like, what does it mean that it is the only foreign currency reserve? Uh, feel free, any one of you to explain. Well, the, the, the USD is, uh, is known as the current uh, reserve currency of the world because uh, one of the main factors was uh, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, made an agreement with the US to supply oil and, and, and basically all of OPEC to supply oil to the world in US dollars. And for any country that's looking to industrialize, it needs oil. So uh, most countries basically need to hold a reserve of US dollars in their in their uh, in, their, in their central banks to purchase this oil to fund the industrialization and the running of the economies. Uh, on top of that, most international trade, uh, because of, of, of most countries having uh, USD uh, in their own uh, accounts, uh, is, is done in USD more as a matter of convenience because everybody has it. It's a very trusted currency. Um, most, uh, if you do any kind of currency trading, you realize that USD is usually what's called the base pair. Everybody trades with regard to USD. So it's, it's a very easy currency to use in that sense. Uh, it, is, if it, it serves its function really well right now. Uh, as a reserve currency, you can easily trade it. It's a good store of value uh, and so on and so forth. So yeah, basically that's, 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 that's the background to why uh, the USD is the current reserve currency. Okay, so I uh, uh, just understand this from a layman point of view, because uh, you said it's a, you said a, it was in trade of dollars. That is pretty straightforward, right? We most of us understand that any trade that goes in dollar, there is a, a trade that goes in the oil. I mean, is traded with dollar, and so there is a cut involved. But then you were mentioning this about the foreign uh, re uh, reserves that everyone is holding, right? So this basically means that. Um, uh, any any um, export invoice, for example, I've come across uh, export invoices. Eighty percent of them are done uh, uh, generally around the world are done in U.S. dollars. And if I understand that correctly, that basically means that any trade going on in the world, be exchanging minerals or whatnot, uh, which uh, are utilizing dollars, that will benefit the U.S. economy. But also, would it also reinforce the the, uh, the standing as a reserve currency because it is. No, so that has no relevance. No, it, it doesn't benefit the U.S. economy uh, directly. Any kind of trade. For, so, for example, if I'm China and Toby is Australia, and I want to buy some copper from Toby, right? If I pay Toby in Chinese yen, Toby can't then turn around and use that Chinese yen to buy whatever Australia needs. He needs to then convert that Chinese yen into something else. For example, he wants to buy something from Russia. He wants to buy something from Singapore. He wants to buy something from India. It needs to convert that currency into rubles or you know Singapore dollar or or the Indian rupee to so that the, the respective countries will accept that and there's a cost uh, involved in that transaction every time you make that I mean it's a small cost but when you're talking about billions and billions of dollars that small spread uh, is what we call uh, you know the small transaction cost amounts to quite a lot yeah so it, it's it's more uh, convenient. And, and, and financially uh, uh, prudent for countries to just trade in USD because with USD, you can, uh, Toby can take that USD immediately buy something from India without converting it anymore. It, it, there's, there's no additional cost involved because USD is, is the reserve currency. 
everybody uses it. Yeah. Okay, I thought that was a very good answer that they clarified quite a bit. And uh, so I think to keep get this uh, moving because we want to keep this short and get the basics done, I will hand it over to uh, Aki. Uh, you had a question you wanted to pose. You are yeah, muted. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, so let's start with me asking you guys, according to you, what is de-dollarization? Drew, do you want to start? I'll let Toby go. I've been talking too much. Okay, let's go with Toby. Well, <clears throat> de-dollarization is the idea that everybody gives up using this convenient means of exchange and starts using something else, I guess. It's interesting, Drew chose the example of China and Australia because in 2013, China and Australia made an agreement to trade in their own national currencies uh, rather than the US dollar. So that's an example of de-dollarization. Now, the thing is, it's not like everyone is forced to use the US dollar. Countries can do what Russia has done recently and insist on their own currency. And as long as there is a demand, as long as people want to do that trade, they can. Uh, so I think sometimes the, the notion of de-dollarization is seen as some kind of revolutionary step forward away from the wicked machinations of those evil Americans. But I'm, I'm not sure I follow that logic because, as Drew said, it's convenient, right? It's convenient for everybody to have a means of exchange. Uh, I think... I think I can help with you know, adding a bit of history how we came to the dollar. Because mm. uh, before World War II, uh, the world is actually more of the colonial world. The colonial empires are the ones that is uh, controlling the world. And United States is, United States is actually you know, more towards uh, keeping to themselves. And World War II you know, caused a very huge change because the all of Europe is totally smashed and they needed uh they, and they needed to pay back the americans for the land list so with, with this uh the americans still loan them even more money so that you know they can rebuild and uh, but then these countries have to pay back and how do they pay back they have to pay back in us dollars and at that time you since all the factories are smashed you know everything is american they are going to buy american goods american stuff everything's american so they just send everything there. They give them the loan. They use the loan money to pay back to build their economies and everything. So, the, so that's how it started. You know, everything is in just US dollars. And because of the paying back of the, the debt and everything, the US dollars just circulates naturally. And so if, uh, yeah. to just get a grip on this, what the Toby is saying, like uh, exemplifying the rubles, right? So that uh, is one, like if uh, there's enough demand, you will get the rubles and so forth. But the U United States dollar as a global reserve currency came to be because after World War II, they basically had all the goods and markets. So it became sort of by default a, a global reserve currency since that was the only one reasonably well, to demand. So well, there's, I wanna... there's a little more to that. So so basically what exactly happened? So what Wyatt said is completely true. But... Uh, to get to that point, there were uh, a bunch of more factors, and that started after World War One. So after World War One, the 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 strongest currency at that point, the pound, British pound, that was very very weak. Their own economy was very weak, and um, even at that time, U.S. was one of the strongest economies. And so what they decided, I think it was in 1938, 1939, they, they sat and what they did was they connected all of the other currencies to all of the European currencies to um, U.S. dollars. So basically, U.S. dollar became connected to all the other uh, British pound, uh, French, whatever their, their currency was, France right. or something. Mm. Um, and uh, that was the, the, the start of it. Um, and because it was such a stable currency, they, they used it for loans and stuff. That was the, the rest of the things that White said. Until finally it became petrodollar in exchange, and it was still backed by gold. Gold was the main... Um, one, one gram of gold used to, used to be equal to one US dollar. That was the main reason that they chose US dollars as the global reserve, reserve currency. Then at around 1970s, 1980s, when it became petrodollar, eventually they decided to, um, everybody okay. had to just, yeah, exactly, exactly. 
so so that's that's how the the story of the dollarization grew and then after that once it connected to the petro petrodollar it became the the only reserve currency before that there was a uh, british pound but now there's just us dollar just that's so i understand I the dynamics here uh, oh sorry yeah i, I, just, I want to I I want to push back on on, on toby's uh, original uh, earlier statement about uh saying that uh, it it, it's more a matter of choice to use the US dollar as the reserve currency and no one's forcing them to do it. By and large, that's true for most trades. But uh, the US is also very interested in keeping the US dollar as the main trading currency for oil specifically, because uh, that's what really kicked off the US uh, dollar as to, the... Uh, according to what I'm taught, okay, so so the, the point is that it, it's not just it's not just a matter of choice. Even if you do have choice, um, there's only so many ways to trade as of now. So for example, um, the SWIFT system. So how does the SWIFT system basically work is that um, all of the countries, let's say you're China, I'm um, Australia, I have to, uh, what I have to do is I have to have an, a bank account in USA as China, you have to have a bank account in uh, USA as Australia. And what is ideally going to happen during, with the SWIFT system that uh, when we do funds transfer, let's say I say that I'm going to pay you 500 US dollars for so and so service, uh, what essentially I'm going to do, I'm going to transfer, uh, I'm going to contact my bank in USA and I'm going to be like transfer 500 US dollars to um, uh, Australia's bank account. And what's what that means is that all of the money that we keep in our reserve in the US bank account, it is available for US to trade. So that, that money is not, not just going to sit there. US is going to make use of that money. So all of that money goes to IMF to further loaning and, you know, all of the things that banks do. Basically, so all of the money that we have, it is stored in USA. In the, in all of the money we have in our reserve bank account is in USA. That's that's a huge power because it it gives US to uh, US the power to use those funds to gain interest, to gain whatever the heck. But basically, it makes USA richer. That's the that's the biggest reason that they do not want to give up the status as the reserve currency. That is the biggest power that they have. It's like an unlimited money move that they get. That is why they yeah. Yeah, I was hoping we could get into the uh, technicalities of that, uh, but just so I briefly have understood the dynamics, so, uh, so we catch, so we don't uh, uh, race so away, right? So we were, uh, because this is a matter of just understanding here, you're, you're saying like, for example, the US dollar, it became prevalent because it had all the goods, right? And then also the gold standard, and this was in part because the US had the majority of the gold, as far as I understand it. So yeah, right. that, that made it possible <laughs> to uh, multiple levels to become a, glo a global reserve currency and then at some point it uh, went off the gold standard which uh, i'm sure we can discuss uh, in more detail soon 71. Uh, in 71 right and this was the disassembly of the what uh, was called the bretton woods act act uh, and uh, we can go up on that too but uh, again uh, so we uh, we are now at the petrodollar stage where uh, sort of the oil is sort of the gold standard in a sense by 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 virtue of uh, moving capital and money in dollars, which in a sense kind of makes the USD like st uh, still the reserve currency in, in part because of the petrodollar, right? I got this correct. And yeah. then the SWIFT, SWIFT becomes then like an, another mechanism they are able to implement a, in a sort of similar way they can implement sanctions because of the US dollar. They, other countries doing sanctions won't have the same effect. Uh, and so that I think, if uh, I if I mean, unless you guys have anything you want to clarify, uh, because I think we're going to get close yeah. now to the uh, the uh, opposing fact, the opponents of uh, the the, the uh, well, the, the real the, rival, the, point, the real rivals, the challengers, shall we say, the yeah, the, the point I wanted to make uh, uh, just Please. now, uh, in terms of the not uh, countries uh, like voluntarily using the U.S. dollar, uh, is that the U.S. has actually taken. A couple of very violent uh, actions to protect us. So the one of the reasons, or rather the key reason, he invaded uh, Iraq and also uh, took up Gaddafi in Libya, in, in Libya was to protect uh, the U.S. dollar. Because right before both of these events, both of those leaders wanted to. Uh, uh, in Saddam's case, he announced that he was going to sell uh, oil outside the U.S. dollar. Uh, yeah, and in Euros. In Gaddafi's case, yeah. And in Gaddafi's case, he wanted to sell up a pan-Africa reserve currency 
and then mm-hmm. sell everything in that reserve currency. Yeah, so it's in then, go back dinas. Yes. In so, so you know, and, and, and any kind of talk, uh, well, in the past, because they're doing this alone, so the US could take them out. But right now, uh, it's happening across the board. Uh, and, you know, most recently we saw China went to uh, 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 Saudi Arabia and the entire uh, Middle Eastern bloc basically came there to meet him to uh, basically, I think, discuss moving ahead as a bloc to move away from the US dollar. So there's more safety in numbers in that sense. Right. So let me ask this thing about force that I said there too, uh, regarding that the US dollar uh, like uh, enforced with military force. So like we can perhaps also see quite a lot of uh, uh, causations or correlations at least where uh, a country that the US have invaded have either tried, you know, either they have something they want to grab. But if that's not the case, if they try to move away from the dollar, it's a surefire way to kind of get the American military attention at you. Uh, I, think I got that right. Just- I think it's not just you no know, military uh, a threat is one thing because military threat uh, is easy because uh, those guys are dictators. They can literally just you no know, dictate and make make this change forcefully. But in most of the world, it's very very hard. For example, why the petrol dollar is so powerful is because everyone needs petrol. Like the whole freaking world needs petrol, and and if you make a deal with OPEC, especially is Saudi led, and then enforce that you no know, all petrols must be sold in US dollars. Then any country that wanted to buy petrol, which every country needs, have to have US dollars. So how do you buy petrol without US dollars? How do you get these US dollars? You have to sell goods or you know, have to do something. You have to sell something and get US dollars in. And then you can have this foreign exchange currency to in order to buy the petrol. You, if you, For example, in a situation like Sri Lanka right now, they cannot buy oil. There's nobody we're gonna is, is gonna sell that the, the whole crisis started off because they have run out of foreign exchange to buy the oil. So the oil is actually sitting just outside their harbor. They cannot they cannot load it because they haven't paid the money. And uh, this is well, the power of the petrol dollar. Right? That's not that's not entirely true. In this case, what happened was uh their economy was based on two things. Yeah, their, their their whole economy was based on tourism and uh and 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 farming exports and uh covid put paid to the tourism part so they were still surviving on the uh, on the uh on the uh farming exports and then uh, their new leader had this bright idea to make everything grown in sri lanka organic so they banned yeah. the import of fertilizers and they collapsed the entire farming industry so right, right. any country because it's usd is a reserve currency you don't have to sell stuff to the us to get usd yeah, yeah, you, you don't have sell to, to US. So yeah, you have to so you sell, can sell to any other country as long as it's Correct. export. No, what so happens to Sri Lanka is that they ran out of US dollars in. No, no, yeah, yeah, I just that's anything else. That's so that's my point. Okay, sell, you have I, to sell I just want to get US dollars. Yeah, Toby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I want to push back on on the the correlation between, say, Saddam wanting to sell oil in euros and being invaded. I mean. It's not just that, right? That's a very, and not only that, it wasn't the US that invaded Iraq. The US and 40 allies invaded Iraq. Now, I really want to, I really want to press back on this idea of like nation states as being, you know, cohesive entities. The reality is that wealthy people from all over the world own shares in US companies and wealthy Americans own shares in companies all over the world. The the corporate community is not ethnically uh, segregated. And so when the decision was made to deal with Saddam, it wasn't so much because he was threatening this critical thing, which was the US reserve currency, and oh, no, America's going to fall into the toilet if they can't sell petrodollars. You know, I think a better way of looking at that is that Saddam was seen as a very troublesome um, troublesome guy who was wrecking everybody's profits, and it was quite profitable to go blow up his country. I mean, you get to sell weapons and and consume a lot of oil. It was, it was a great business venture. Now, I'm, I'm not saying it was justified or anything like that. I'm just saying it's very simplistic to, to, to imagine that the reserve currency is the only thing that matters and all power flows from it. It's, it's, I, I rather suspect it's the other way around because if you have a look historically at who held the reserve currencies, 
it kind of helps if you've got a blue water navy that controls trade. That's why the British had it, because the Americans had the power and they had the, the economic output and they had the goods to trade. And it was very, very attractive to wealthy people all over the world. People wanted to invest in America and they did. And so I think it's, you know, there's a real danger that we fall into an overly simplistic view of the world where every country is acting as though it's an entity that is separate from all the others. The, the, the US dollar as a reserve currency and also the pound before it, these were, these were the currencies that everybody with an interest in trading chose and because it was convenient and because it was uh, secure. I mean, remember, credit, credos, trust, right? The, the, the reason everyone was able to trust the US dollar in the Bretton Woods Agreement was because it was backed by gold. No one, no one in Europe could afford to back their currency with gold because they didn't have any. They were all broken by the war. The, the US was very wealthy, which made it very trustworthy. If you had your US dollars, you knew that it had some value. Likewise, when it became the petrodollar, you knew that you could get a certain amount of oil, you know, which is black oh, gold. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Because I was hoping uh, one of you could perhaps say, uh, because, you know, Saudi Arabia is not the only country that produces gold, uh, oil, right? It's just <laughs> one of the biggest ones, right? And so the, the, the trading with other oil countries and so forth, uh, you know, the, uh, could you please elaborate a little bit more? Like, how, how does Saudi Arabia become the main anchor for the petrodollar, even though it doesn't produce, like, it's the biggest producer, but it doesn't produce, like, half of the yeah. world's oil, right? Like, so, uh, okay, could well, you explain well, a little bit how, how that happens? I'll get to that, but I, I just want to uh, carry on Toby's point a little bit more. Uh, it, this idea that uh, the, 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 the uh, that the, each state is not its own, I guess, own acting in its own specific interests and that there are corporate interests out there. This idea is not diametrically opposed to the idea that a state would still defend, in this case, US, would still defend its interests uh, in, in having its reserve currency. Yeah, there, are, there, are, there are two things that can happen together. It, it's more a matter of, um, of, of layers of, 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 uh, of, of layers of, of, of well, uh, interest so you can yeah, have think, the right so this like a, like the Toby alluded to earlier that it's uh, <clears throat> not necessarily the u.s controlling the dollar but the u.s being controlled by the dollar is that sort of kind no of it's, you're... it's more like it is it's sure the u.s has interest in protecting the dollar the u.s also has interest in you know invading to get its uh, mic uh, justification to buy, sell weapons to to you know send money to its its, its companies that rebuilt iraq and all those things so all of these things are, uh, uh, you know, contributing factors to why the U.S. invaded. And no, the U.S. didn't invade before the other countries. They went to the U.N. Security Council and got rejected. So the 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 the, 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 the invasion of Iraq was 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 considered illegal under international law, but they still did it anyway because it's the U.S. No one can stop them to do what they want to do, right? Yeah. So they uh, the, to answer coping things question about. Saudi Arabia, they 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 kind of the lead, de facto leader of OPEC, and then they 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 uh they, where so they they made an agreement where all of OPEC will sell in U.S. dollars, and that and, that's and what, OPEC uh, is uh, just a uh, simplified terms that is the uh, global oil cartel of the the formal club of uh, oil producing countries, uh, yeah. kind of, right? Yeah, it's, it's a bunch of oil producing countries like uh, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I don't Brilliant. know. There are three Russia, other founding countries. Qatar. So, uh, so no, would it be Russia like Saudi Arabia? So would Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Russia right. So plus would Saudi Arabia, in in a sense, like it, like maybe this analogy is very inaccurate, but would Saudi Arabia, in terms of OPEC and the relevance of kind of pegging a, a currency through the oil uh, exchanges, would Saudi Arabia sort of like be the leader of uh, NATO in <laughs> OPEC terms, right? The leader of yeah, uh, yeah. More in less, a sense. Yeah. So, so that's why the U.S. struck a deal with them, and by having a deal with them, the other OPEC countries uh, complied essentially. Kind of yeah, yeah. Okay. And I Very think if Saudi, if Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> sorry, Keep it's a mutually you know beneficial you no know, thing between Saudi Arabia and U.S. because U.S. <clears throat> protect, provides the protection, you know, this like the bodyguard for Saudi Arabia, and in, in exchange, uh, all the oil is traded in U.S. dollars and. 
and that is beneficial to Saudi Arabia anyway. Uh, firstly, they need the security. They are big, but they are not powerful in terms of military. Uh, and the, the 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 region is very volatile. So they, they if they have a US bank, you know, they can they, they can really become the big boss, uh, which is what they are uh, in the region. And on top of that, I forgot my point. So you know, uh, yeah, I'll end at this. <laughs> I forgot what I want to say. But that, the the key point is that there is the exchange in terms of security for the. No, so I think that was a good. Now I think we are a, now that we're getting like forty minutes into the stream, and we have an elaborated what is the global uh, the USD as um, <clears throat> the global reserve currency? How did it get there? Uh, what are the power dynamics in terms of not just trade but also other institutions such as OPEC and and so forth? Um, maybe there's we should. One more, uh, well, there's one more point we missed. I thought oh. someone else might get to, but one yeah. of the advantages of being the reserve currency is that if you're not a reserve currency and you print a whole bunch of money and you want to sell it for other currencies or you want to, you know, why would anyone buy it? You know, what are they going to do with it? Whereas one of the great advantages that the American administrations have had is because everybody else, especially, you know, if, they, if their economies are growing, because they need the, the, the dollars to go buy stuff, the American government has been able to just print them and, and, the, and sell them. And, and find buyers for it. And that's been a huge benefit to the US economically. But I wouldn't I wouldn't fall into the trap of overstating that. It's not like that's the the be all and end all of uh, American power and wealth. It's certainly, you know, it's handy and, and other people might envy that. And certainly, you know, other leaders of states might want that for themselves. But just because you want something and it, it's good doesn't mean that you have the capacity to get it. And so, you know, again, if if let, let's just say Putin or Z want to have a shot at the title and they think we should be the reserve currency. Well, credit is a matter of trust. Like you need everybody else to get on board with that. It's like throwing a party. What if no one comes? Right. And that's Putin's big problem. What if no one could be bothered? And, and you know, getting back to this idea of the international corporate community, the idea that anyone else is going to come along and displace America as the seat of a place where anyone can do business, right? Remember, the business of America is business. Now, I've, I've had arguments with American lawyers about this. They're like, you know, they sneer at me and talk about the military and the 12 fleets. But, but uh, you know, I like to believe that the business of America is business because I'm a bit of a... <coughs> Yeah, a bit of an admirer of, of, of America. And so when, when we talk about de-dollarization, you're really talking about someone's going to throw a party and everyone's going to turn up. And and I don't see yeah. it. I do yeah, not let, see let, that. Let, let, me just, let me just add on to that. Uh, so it's not as simple as, as the US. Uh, it, it's not as simple as trust and the US printing money and everybody's willing to buy it. What happens when a, a country prints money? And this goes with, for any currency is that so basically, you imagine the whole economy, say, has a hundred US dollars in it. If you print more, in the, and the amount on the goods and services stay the same, what it means is that each of the uh, existing hundred dollars gets a little bit diluted. So you can so for the same goods, a bunch of goods and services, instead of hundred dollars, now there's hundred ten dollars. So you need you need you need more of the same USD to buy the same goods. That's why yeah. that's why. That's why a lot of the uh, a lot of uh, people in the Western economies are realizing, hey, my parents could buy a house with fifty thousand dollars in the past. Why can't I? Even buy, I can't even buy a room with fifty thousand dollars now. You know, it's because yeah. of this thing is diluting the money. And the reason why the U.S. can keep doing that is because everybody has U.S. dollars. So when they print more U.S. dollars, everybody is getting poorer. Uh, relative to yeah. the amount of US dollars. They this have. is why we're getting yeah. the global inflation as well. You know, the whole world is yes. having inflation right now. Partly because so, you no know, US US have been you no know, printing money freely during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah you know, and everybody's the getting poorer money. together. Yeah. So you can see the this whole world is in the stock market. In, in 2008, when when they when they did the uh, quantitative easing, right? That that's when they really started to ramp up the printing of the money. If you look at the S and P 500, it was at about 800 to 1,000 points. It was quite a volatile period because you know because of the dope crash, and uh, about uh, this time last year, right now it's about four thousand points. This time last year was about five thousand points. The companies didn't, you know, quadruple in size and in revenue and you know, 
or, or in, 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 yeah. in production during that time. What's happened is that, you know, it's inflation. You, now you need more money. So in the past, you need maybe $1,000 to buy one, one chunk of five, top 500 companies in the US. Now you need $4,000. It's, it's not that these companies are more valuable. It's that your, the dollar that you own in your pocket is less valuable. So you need more of it to buy stuff. Yeah, that, uh, and that perhaps relates very well into the issue of trust because uh, that is one of the reasons the U.S. have been used for so long. And that is why we're starting to see contenders. Uh, and I think uh, maybe uh, we should uh, briefly outline a little bit uh, what is BRICS and uh, what does that mean in terms of the dollarization? Uh, yeah, oh, please, Aki. I, I want to first go back to Toby's point and I want to add a little bit to it. So when we're talking about de-dollarization, we are not talking about another super powerful reserve currency coming and overtaking um, US dollar. No, that's not going to happen. I, I don't even see that happening in the next hundred years. I see that happening. What, what, yes and no, but what exactly is de-dollarization de in terms of that is introduction of other reserve currencies. So EU, well, the euro, euro yes. is basically the, this, currently it is the second reserve currency in the world, precisely because it has backing off a bunch of other countries, other powerful countries. But E e euro is also connected to US dollar. So it's basically the same thing. It stays, what what BRICS is trying to do is cre introducing another currency, which is backed by gold, what basically Muammar Gaddafi was trying to do. So um, they're not trying to overtake US dollar. They're trying to add another alternative because right now, like I previously stated, it there is only one there. There's not too many options. There's one swift mechanism. There's one um, US dollar that you can use to buy oil. So both of these things are like an infinite money glitch for for working in favor of USA because all the money that that they that you want to trade in is stored in US dollars and and what US does uses that money to further trade or uh, charge interest using IMF or uh, even using it for their own development in their country and um, whatever they get in return they it's it's the same way the banks work that the same mechanism is used by US dollar that's it and yeah, if I, you I, I, if you introduce another currency to that, that 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 basically takes away half of the power because you give um, you give other countries like let's say Zimbabwe, you give them another option to to trade in. That's that's basically what we're talking about when we are talking about de-dollarization. We are not talking about dollar becoming worthless. We're talking about another competitor entering the market. That's why I asked. Them. A whole lot of yeah, geopolitical I, 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 dynamics I, 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 changing. No, no, sorry, I, I, I didn't agree with that assessment because the whole idea of a reserve currency is so that one country can buy from another country in the reserve currency and then sell on to a third country in the reserve currency. But, but if you are talking about s several reserve currencies, they are not reserve currencies anymore. The whole idea mm. of reserve currencies, everybody has the same currency. What you're talking about is multiple uh, local currencies that they trade with each other. So it's it's inconvenient, but it's possible. But when you talk about reserve currency, it really means one currency to rule them all. Yeah. I so think which is why the part where... That's a really good point. Yeah. But because I was going to mention that it's yeah. go back. So if it is go back, then this currency will be actually consistent throughout the entire world. No, I... I, I, I but it cannot really be a don't... national currency, which is why the yeah. BRICS is not talking about one national currency no, becoming the reserve currency. They're talking about creating a new currency that is backed by BRICS, yeah, okay. uh, so, which is separate. Yeah, so, so, so let me let me kind of uh, give 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 uh, kind of a structure to how I see things uh, uh, work, working out. Okay, because if you're gonna have a BRICS reserve currency, the the problem with currencies and any kind of pegging or whatever is that currencies always come under attack. So, for example, if China says, "Okay, my yuan is pegged to." A basket of currencies. Of course, they won't tell you what basket and how much percentage. But if people will try to gamble to see, hey, you know, if I if I throw a billion dollars at yuan, it will crack. And it has happened before in Thailand, in many many economies. You know, if, uh, the traders will go in and try, it. because once it cracks and it loses the pack, uh, you 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 what happens is is something like uh, that that lunar uh, uh, currency. Remember in, in crypto where they, they say, okay, we'll peg it to the US dollar, one lunar stable coin is equal to one US dollar. 
and because Luna is such a small thing, it got attacked and then it, it fell apart. And and immediately everybody lost their shirt that had Luna. Of course, the attackers made a, a big chunk of uh, uh, cash. Yeah. So what's going to happen with the reserve currency is that they, they cannot have a reserve currency that is uh, backed to packed to anything because it, it will it will come and attack. And then when it comes under attack, which of those currencies is China going to exhaust its reserves just to help? reserve this reserve currency that benefits everybody no 